Hello everyone and welcome to chapter one using our A plus guide to managing and maintaining your PC. Chapter one is over the first look at computer parts and tools. Now this chapter serves as an introduction to the basic hardware components inside a computer. You will learn how to identify basic PC hardware devices as well as how to identify different power connectors used in connecting devices. Safety techniques for the handling of electronic components is also covered during this chapter. Now we have three objectives that we will meet through covering chapter one here. We'll learn about the various parts inside a computer case and how they connect together and are compatible. The second objective is to learn how to protect yourself and the equipment against the dangers of electricity when working inside a computer case. Finally, you'll learn about tools you will need as a PC hardware technician and safety precautions when working around computer equipment. Now, as you're going through Chapter 1, there are several of the CompTIA A Plus objectives that will be met or at least introduced during the chapter. We'll be going over the following CompTIA objectives for the CompTIA A Plus 220-801 objectives we will meet the domain 1.0 PC hardware and under that domain we will be completing 1.7 which is compare and contrast various connection interfaces and explain their purpose 1.8 is to install an appropriate power supply based on a given scenario and 1.11 is to identify connector types and associated cables in this portion there will be a lot of different connectors and cables you want to learn about so make sure you go back and look at those several times then for the CompTIA A Plus 220802 exam objectives, we'll be looking at Domain 5.0, which is over operational procedures. We will go over 5.1, which is given a scenario, use appropriate safety procedures. And 5.2 for Domain 5.0 is explain environmental impacts and the purpose of the environmental controls. Lastly, we'll go over Domain 4.0, which is a troubleshooting section. And for this, we will be looking at 4.2, which is given a scenario, troubleshoot common problems related to motherboards, RAM, CPU, and power with the appropriate tools. So those are the various objectives we'll be seeing as we go through Chapter 1. So as you can remember those in the back of your mind, as you get to those in the chapter, they will be identified. Just try to think back of those and like, okay, maybe I need to learn a little bit more about that. And you can do some outside troubleshooting or ask some questions or do some research just so you're comfortable with meeting those objectives. Now, we won't fully cover those objectives, but those objectives are throughout this chapter. Okay, now that we've covered the objectives, let's go ahead and jump right into the chapter. First part of the chapter, we talk about what's inside the case. In computer cases, you'll, you'll see very many variations, but we'll just kind of go over some of the basics in those. All right, computer case, we sometimes call this a chassis. Uh, it holds the power supply, the motherboard, the processor, memory module sticks, expansion cards, a hard drive, obviously, an optical drive, as well as various other drives. We can have a tower case. Now, a tower case, you'll notice, is usually one that stands upright. And you can hold several drives in these. There'll be some plates on the front that you can take out and you can put other uh, parts in the front you know if you want to add another DVD drive or whatever you might want to if a card reader possibly then we have a desktop case which generally lies flat and sometimes you'll see that people will set their monitors on top of those just for space constraints we also have a laptop case and you've probably seen these all around you and there's also the all-in-one case which is everything for the computer is all in one device Let's take a look at some of that now. You'll see here inside, as I mentioned in this figure, you can see that we have a power supply up top here. And that is identified by the arrow. We have different drives here along the front, what would be the front of the case. We have power cords that run all throughout the motherboard and connect to the power supply. We have the processor, which is underneath our fan here. This particular model has two hard drives installed and you can see the SATA cables that are connecting those and we'll go over those later. And then we have the motherboard which is this large section here which everything you can see connects to it at some point. We have the front of the case or sometimes called the shell of the chassis. 
We have different memory slots available here where we can put RAM in. We'll go over those later throughout the course. And you can see, as I already said, we have the different data cables. There's so many parts here and we'll go over them throughout the chapter or throughout the course. Now motherboard. This is sometimes called the system board. Some people you might here call it the MOBO. This is the largest circuit board of your computer. It's very critical to the whole computer running. The processor, we call this the CPU, the central processing unit. This processes most of your data and handles your instructions for the entire system. Now the CPUs generate heat and they require a heat sink and a fan to keep them cool. And we'll be going over this in later chapters as well, but if that overheats, we have big problems. The heat sink consists of metal fins that kind of draw the heat away and then push that air out. And you'll see this in the labs as well as other chapters. Now an expansion card, sometimes called an adapter card, is a circuit board that provides more ports than those provided by the motherboard. And you see that in the previous picture that we had it, that the motherboard has several expansion slots to be used by these various expansion cards. Now today most ports are generally covered by the motherboard, but you can also buy those expansion slots or expansion cards if you need more. Let's say you need more USB ports or you need uh, some other, you know, other monitors or types of display ports you want, need, you can buy an expansion card for those. Now here in figure 1.-4 you can see that these are the various ports provided by a general motherboard. And we also have many that will go over throughout the course. But just get a good feeling for these such as your HDMI ports. If you have never seen those, um, you can see that the differences between the different USB ports such as in our figure here we have the blue USB ports are being identified as the USB 3.0 where the older 2.0 ports are black and those just and we'll go over the speeds differences between those later on but just be f very familiar with the different ports on your motherboards and expansion cards and table t Two, or 1.1 goes over various ports used with both laptop and desktop computers. You'll definitely want to take a good look at these tables here. As you can see, the first one here is the VGA or Video Graphics Array port. We also call this the DB15 port. As you can see in count, there are 15 pins holes here. And this is the male or female port that will allow your male end of your VGA cable to be plugged in here. Now this VGA only allows for transmissions of analog video. So if you see a cable that says that it transmits audio as well, that's not accurate. Now you can see here in the definition this is analog meaning that only it's continuous signal with infinite variations as compared to digital which is just a series of binary values of ones and zeros most monitors you'll probably come across have this VGA port on them a lot of monitors are putting this as well as your DVI so just take a look and make sure that if you're getting one or you have to work on one make sure you check the monitor first to know if you've got the right cable there to be able to install that or if the computer itself has the right port on it for the monitor if you've got a monitor that is VGA only and you've got the desktop and it only supports DVI then you've run into a problem you're likely going to have to get an adapter to be able to use that or possibly return the monitor to get the correct one to go with that computer. You can also see here next we have the S video port. This is a either a four pin or seven pin round video port sometimes used to connect to a television. If, if you take a look at some of your TVs you may see this round port before and you didn't know what it was. Now you know it's a video port. Here in our picture here we do have the seven pin being shown and you can just count those. We also have the DVI or digital video interface port. This transmits digital or analog video. There are three types of DVI ports that we're going to cover in future chapters so we'll get to those in a few weeks. The HDMI, one of the most popular ports around now. This is the high definition multimedia interface port. This transmits digital videos and audio does not carry any type of analog transmission.
and most of your home theater equipment with your TVs, game consoles, stuff will now be providing a HDMI port. A display port not used as much but it does transmit your video and audio both digitally. So, you know, it's, the book says that slowly replacing VGA and DVI ports still has not gained a lot of popularity. Next we have the Thunderbolt transmission which transmits video and data on the same port and cable. The port is shaped as you can see as the display port and it's compatible with both your display port devices as well. You've got a one here you've probably seen and used many of times. This is the network port. We call this the Ethernet port or the RJ45 port because it takes an RJ45 connector to be inserted there. This is for your fast Ethernet. Uh, you can, you know, depending on your device and, and the port, you can get up to 100 megabits per second if you have that speed available to you. But as always with anything in the computing world, you're only as fast as your slowest component. So if you have a very slow Ethernet connection, even though your Ethernet jack and, and card can handle a faster speed, you're only going to go as fast as the speed coming into it. Now we'll look at our audio or sound ports. These are ports are usually here for such things as microphones or speakers. And you can see that usually on there they will be identified with a little icon as well. If you have one audio cable to connect to a speaker or earbuds, plug it into the lime green sound port in the middle of these three ports here that are shown. Now, you will see these sometimes on the front of a computer as well. As some, based on your motherboard setup, you will have some on the front as well as the back. And that just allows you some convenience if you're using a desktop that's the, you know, ports, you know, you've got a headphone and it maybe doesn't have a long enough cable to go to the back, you can plug it into that front jack. We have our SPDIF one, our Sony Philips digital interface sound. This is a sound port as well, and this connects to some home theater systems. You may have seen these before, and it does require that special cable. Here we have the universal serial bus ports. These are just what we normally call the USB ports. Most devices that you'll come across if they're not Bluetooth will require a USB port, and sometimes you'll run out of those USB ports, and you might have to get an expansion hub. Next we have the FireWire port. We also call this the IEEE 1394 port. It is used for high-speed multimedia devices such as a digital camcorder in case you're wanting to upload your videos to your computer if you're going to do some type of work with those. Next we have the eSATA or external SATA. and This is used by an external hard drive that allows you to actually use that eSATA interface. And this will is definitely faster than the FireWire connection if you have the option go with the eSATA. This blue or lightly purple and green connectors next are the PS2 ports. We also call these the mini DIN ports. These are six pin round connectors used by generally a keyboard or a mouse. These ports kind of look like but they are not interchangeable. On a PC the purple is used for the keyboard and the green port is used for the mouse. And lastly, we have an older serial port, sometimes called a DB9 port or DB9 connector. As you can see, has nine pins visible. And this nine min pill mail port is used on older computers. It's mainly been replaced by the use of our USB ports, which we are never have enough of. The last two ports we will go over are the parallel port. You probably haven't used this one in a while, or you might have used it and you we're wondering what happened to that. Well, this is a 25 pin female port used by old style printers. This older port has been replaced once again by our current USB ports. If you've got a printer that still uses this 25 pin connector, you may have problems finding the ability to keep using that printer where you're going to have to buy a card or find an old card on eBay that still allows you to use this interface. Lastly, we have a modem port. It's also called an RJ11 port. You've probably haven't used these in a long time, but this is for a dial-up phone line for your computer internet. This modem port looks like a network port, but it's not quite as large. And here at the left, we can see that we have the RJ45 on the left, the larger, and the RJ11 port here on the right. If you want to take a good look at comparing those, if you can get an Ethernet cable, and you can get an old telephone line cable, 
put those side by side and that'll be a great comparison help you kind of remember the difference between the two